Shabbat Shalom, children of our Father. Thank you for joining us this week. I hope and trust you all had a blessed week. And looking forward to your Shabbat with our King and Father. So again, thank you for joining us for this Shabbat table, Mana. And our parasha for this week, or Torah portion, is called Balak. And we will be reading out of Numbers 22 verse 2 to Numbers 25 verse 9. The Haftarah or the Prophets section is uh, Mika 5 verse 6 to 8. And the Renewed Testament section is Matthew 21 verse 1 to 11. So like I said, it's called Balak. But um, let's quickly recap last week. So we saw last week and we had this amazing scriptures and readings where we read about the red heifer and how this represents the Messiah. How the red heifer cow represents Israel or the bride as well. So this red heifer was taken outside of the camp to be slain just like Messiah was. How the remains of the body of this red heifer, in other words, its ashes mixed with water, became the very instrument used to cleanse those who became unclean. And also to cleanse the sanctuary, to sanctify and to purify the tabernacle and all the pieces inside of the tabernacle and how Messiah, our Savior, uh, He's the one now who's restoring us back to the Father. He's the one who cleans us from our sin. He's the one who takes us from darkness into light. He became the living water for you and me. So just like the Messiah purifies, His blood purifies and sanctifies us. Part of this sacrifice was where the priest had to take a piece of cedar wood and a hyssop and a scarlet yarn. And this was thrown into the fire with the red heifer. And this, like we discussed last week, represented you and me. It is our hard-headedness. It's, it's our own desires that had to be burned away so that we can humbly submit to our Creator and King. So that we can walk in His purpose in our lives, in with His will in our lives. You see, because He takes us from darkness to light, so He removes this bondage of sin in our lives. We also saw how Moses was instructed to raise up the bronze serpent and how it represents Messiah who is our healer and how we should keep our eyes focused on Him only. You see, because we can't heal ourselves. We can't walk in our own strength and our own might and think that we can restore ourselves. No, we need to look upon Messiah. He is the one that was lifted up. He is the restorer and ourself, the one who saves us. We then continued our reading when Moses was instructed to speak to the rock. But out of frustration and anger for the children of Israel, he became disobedient and he struck the rock twice with his staff. We learned that if we strike the rock all the time, then we are not acting in faith and we are disobedient. Because we, we are called as children of the light to walk in light. In other words, to walk in faith. And here again we see the standard of, of my faith. Whereby I speak in faith. I walk in faith. Moses was called to speak to the rock. You see, the children of Israel was used to being forced into labor uh, to, to, or being forced to do what needed to be done in Egypt. They were beaten to do their work. So that is why Moses had to strike the rock the first time in Exodus 17. But then in Numbers, he was instructed to speak to the rock. You see, this new generation of Israel that, that were born in, in the wilderness, that grew up in the wilderness, had to learn to walk in faith. They had to learn to speak to the rock. They needed to speak to the Father. You see, child of the Most High, Abba listens. He listens to us. But do we speak to Him? We get to call on the living water. 
Faith is about proclaiming. Faith is not about acting out our emotions or acting in my own power or might. You see, it's not what I can achieve, but what Father can do through my faith. My faith in Him. In faith, my words carry authority. Not mine. The Father's authority. You see, acting in faith is speaking with authority and only by the authority of the Father can my faith go into action. The living word manifests himself through my words. I, wanna, I want you to hear me today. The living word, Messiah himself, according to John, he's the living word. He manifests himself through my words that I speak in faith. So by speaking in faith, Living water starts flowing in me. When I strike the rock, in other words, not acting in faith, then it's like, it's like crucifying Yeshua. It's like I'm denying him like the Pharisees denied him. You see, by my actions, I deny the Messiah. In, by my actions, I deny the Restorer. You see, by my actions, my thirst will not be quenched. And I will always be thirsty. I will always be longing for more because I do not walk in faith. Because my eyes are not kept on Him. So Messiah was this red heifer. He became unclean so that I can be clean and righteous. Messiah is the one who delivers us from sickness and our enemies. Yeshua is our overcomer and our rock. So let's confess Messiah in our lives through the faith we speak. And this brings us now to uh, this uh, Torah portion of us this week called Balak. So as we continue with our study through the book of Bermudbar on Numbers, we see every week that we have to get to know Abaya. We have to get to know his heart and his ways, but also we have to learn to be obedient, and obedience comes by faith. So we see all these lessons that we are taught about what happened in the wilderness to the children of Israel, because, my brother and sister, it impacts you and me in our daily lives. It will impact our children in their daily lives. The lessons we learn from Israel will impact our children's children in their daily lives. The word of Abba Yah is a living word. You, you see what Israel had to learn. You and I and all generations will have to follow and learn as well. We all serve one master Yeshua. It's one word. It's one spirit. He does not change. And we need to walk in faith. Keeping our eyes on Him. From the beginning we've seen that we need to be careful with our words. We need to be careful of what we say. What we do. How we act and also how we speak. Or even interact in our communities and not just our families. So far we've been speaking a lot about what we say and how we say it. And to whom we say what. And that is again the main theme for this week. Because when we do not use our words and tongues to bless people, brothers and sisters, then we curse them. And that is what we see with Balak and Balaam. So this week we are talking about Parasha Balak. And even though this Parasha is, like I said, called Balak, we will mostly be talking about Balaam and what he did or not did or did not do. When we study this Parasha, then... There's two things that stands out for me. Firstly, it's fear. What or who guides our fear and what happens when we submit to that? In other words, what happens when we start to act in fear? And secondly, is there a price to obedience that I'm looking to earn or to gain? Or am I obedient because of relationship? You see, because obedience in relationship brings blessings. Last week we spoke about anger and how we react 
out of that. Just like Moses was angry for Israel, and that's why he struck the rock twice. Now this week we see that two men was filled with fear. The one man called Balak who was filled with fear of this world and fear of man and the fear of loss because he's the king of Moab. He's, he's the people that follows him expect something from him. And then also in this parasha, but we're not talking about it, there's a man called Phineas who, who was filled with the fear of Abba Yah. Like I said, we are not talking about him today, but rather we will discuss Billiam, a man that was filled with pride and greed. And we will talk about this spirit of Billiam and how it impacts the church and the communities and the believers. We read in Numbers, if you will follow me, Numbers 22, verse 1 to 7, And the children of Israel set out and camped in the desert plains of Moab, beyond the Yardin of Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid. Can we see this fear? He was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was in dread because of the children of Israel. If we can remember uh, previous studies where Father asked Moses to do a census and we saw that the army of Israel, the men, the army was 600,000 men. So Moab is seeing this, this, this king of Moab is seeing this and he became exceedingly fearful. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this company is leaking up all that is around us as an ox leaks up the grass of the field. Now Balak, son of Zoror, was the sovereign of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers to Balaam, son of Beor, at Petr, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, See, a people has come from Mitzrayim. See, they have covered the surface of the land and are settling next to me. And now please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are too strong for me. It might be that I strike them and drive them out of, out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian left with the feast of divination, divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and spoke the words of Balak to him. So this parasha starts with Balak saying that these people that were redeemed out of Egypt conquered the Amorites and now they are coming for us. So what are we going to do? So one of the first questions I felt in my spirit when I started reading this verse was, how did Balak knew about Balaam? Has he used him before? I mean, to call someone to come and curse a people is a radical thing in warfare, isn't it? Unless you know that it works. Maybe Balak has done this before. I mean, to send men to the house of Balaam with fees of divination in their hands. How did he know what would be enough? How did he know this will turn Balaam Billiam to come to him. Was Billiam a reliable uh, and known person for divination practices? Because surely you will not ask a man of Alua to curse the people of Alua. You will not ask a man of God to curse the people of God. Now where do we read that? That we can ask the fivefold ministry to curse the children of Israel, to curse the believers of Yah. Nowhere in the Bible does it stand. Nowhere in the Bible is the practice. You see, the Moabites was a descendant of Lot. And that we can read in Deuteronomy 2 verse 9. They were actually blessed by Abba. He gave them this piece of land. The Israelites did not need anything because Father supplied what they needed, their food and their water. 
So why did King Balak react the way he did? You see, it's fear, my brothers and sisters. So who or what do we see as enemies or who is not our enemy? Do we see a, a possible fight or war coming up even if it's not a, a fight? Do we see the enemy in everything? Maybe we should ask, have you ever wasted a wonderful opportunity? Have you ever been afraid of something or someone or acted negatively towards that person or that situation because you saw fear or you were in fear? What would have happened if you have uh, embraced it rather than to fight it? Could it have been uh, a blessing for us? Uh, 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 could it have been good for you to face your fear? To face this possible lie from the enemy? Could you and I have gained something rather than to have lost something? Maybe we would have made new friends instead of enemies. Maybe we'd have learned out of that situation. Maybe we would have gained strength to carry on. We saw last week in Parashah Hukat that when Israel asked Edom if they could travel through their land and that Edom refused them. In fact, Edom was ready to go to war against Israel, their brothers, but neither Father nor Moses wanted to make war against them. We see in this story of the Moabites that not every situation that looks like a danger is danger. Not every situation we should see as fear. What keeps you and me awake at night, my brothers and sisters? And then during the day we realize that it actually was nothing to be worried about. How many times don't we react just because we think we know what's going to happen and then the opposite happens? You see, we are to trust. We are to put our faith in our Heavenly Father. Every day you and I have to make a decision. Are we, are we going to be ruled by fear or are we going to be ruled by faith? Listen to what I'm saying, are we going to be ruled by fear or are we going to be ruled by faith? Because there's a direction I can take in both. One leads to death. One leads to spiritual death and sometimes even our physical deaths. One is self-gain, but the other one, my brothers and sisters, leads to life. It leads to blessing. It leads to the arms and the presence of the Father. So we started by reading about this Moabite king called Balak who sees this multitude of people on the borders of his land and he fears for them because he heard how they just destroyed the Amorites. He heard what happened to Pharaoh and his armies that followed him. And now... He wants to hire Balaam. We see that the strategy of Balak is different than the strategies of many other kings. Because any other king would gather up arms and go into battle first. But no, Balak tries a new strategy. And we must see the strategy of Hasatania. He wants to weaken the children of Israel by first getting them under uh, Abba's uh, cavalry. He wants to get them and remove them from the blessings of the Father. He wants to turn, uh, he wants to turn, get Israel to turn their back on the Father or to turn Abba's back on them. Balak wants to expose the children of Israel without the protection and the covering of Abaya. Balak wants to weaken them first before he attacks them. So instead of sending messengers to Moses and to the children of Israel to hear what their plans are or their intentions are, no, no. Instead of asking Moses, are you here for battle, Moses? Why, Moses, why are you passing through my land or by my land? 
What's going on here, Moses? So now we see that he sends a messenger to Balaam to give him this fees of divination in return for his services. In other words, Balaam is a prophet for hire. So Balak just assumes there's a war coming. Balak acts in fear because of fear. How much in our daily lives do we just assume, my brother and sister? How much do we just react without having all the information? Maybe we should ask the question, why did Balak not ask Balaam to bless the Moabite armies before they go to war or something? Why curse Israel instead? You see, here we go with the same mindset we got to do with nowadays where we so many times hear about this anti-semitic um, people and how they act against Israel how so many people want to see Israel struggle they want to see Israel in constant war and they do not want peace in Israel they don't want Israel to prosper You see, people don't want the children of Abba to be blessed. You know, it's like having a mindset, if, if I can't be blessed, then why should you be blessed? Isn't that what we see around us and even from our own friends and families, our own churches and fellowships? They would rather want you to be cursed then be blessed because they want the blessing. Is it because people fear you? Is it because people fear us and just like Balak feared the children of Israel now, he wants them to be cursed? Could it be hatred, my brother and sister? So rather than looking at how we can work together as a community, work together as a country, how we can work together as a church or a fellowship, now we would rather curse. In, in, instead of realizing that if my brother is blessed, I can be blessed through him, now we would rather curse. You see, what is more important to us? If we work together, then we both are blessed. But if we stand up against each other, then we just hurt each other. Abba calls us, and that is our instruction studies and Torah studies, is to be a united body. Father calls us to be a united nation in Him. Not to be divided. So as we continue with the Torah readings, we see that three times Biliam goes onto some high place and instead of cursing the Israelites, he ends up blessing them. And he blesses uh, in, 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 in a very important uh, words that he proclaims over them. You see, Biliam talks about the beauty of their tents. He talks about their travels through the wilderness and the abundance of Abaya. And then he prophesies about the end of days and the coming of our King Messiah Yeshua. We read in Numbers 23, 26, And Balaam answered and said to Balak, Have I not spoken to you, saying that, I, that all that Yah speaks, that I do? So the king of Moab is angry about this. Because Balaam is being paid to curse the children of Israel, but he blesses them because Father said, I will guide your speech, I will guide your tongue. So Balaam ends up blessing the children of Israel and this king of Moab, Moab is not happy with this now. So he confronted Balaam who then says, but their God, the God of Israel, Abba Yah, the Allah of Israel, he's guarding them. He's protecting them. But then he goes on to say, but I can tell you what you can do. So he then tells Balak what to do so that the children brings a curse onto themselves. 
So he suggests to Balak, send Moabite men and women into the Israel camp to entice them with adultery and listen, idolatry. You see, more importantly, to eat food that is offered to, a, to the Moabite God pure. You see, when we turn our backs on our heavenly king and we decide to follow the world kings and their gods, then we move out from the covering of the Father. So in doing this, then the children of Israel chooses out of their own accord, out of their own free will to walk out or to leave the covering of Abba. So then the children of Israel brings a curse on themselves. We clearly learn in this parasha that even though we have a covering with the Father, that we can bring a curse over ourselves. The covenant we have with the Father is, is conditional to our obedience. And we must understand this today, my brothers and sisters. Your salvation and my salvation is conditional. So everything that the people and churches and fellowships and Torah groups are teaching you about the grace of the Father, that you and I can do whatever we want, say whatever we want, go whatever we want, and we saved by grace. That's a false teachings, my brother and sister. Listen and study this parasha today. Our salvation is conditional. And the condition is obedience to the Father. So we are protected under his wings if we stay obedient to him. In other words, if we do not walk out from under his covering, if we do not turn our backs on him, if we keep our eyes on him, then we are covered by him. And as long as we do that, then we walk in his grace by faith. Can we see that today? So can we see that if you and I stay obedient to Abba Yah, if we listen to Him and follow Him, then we stay under His covering. We must understand that Abba gives us so much grace because, because it's because of our obedience to Him. Father protects us. He gives us grace, but if we choose to leave His covering, then we must deal with the consequences. And so many times, consequences is death. The Bible says in Proverbs 26 verse 2, As a bird wanders, as a swallow flies about, so a curse without a cause does not come. Listen, so a curse without a cause does not come. So a curse without a cause can have no effect. So, if I did not cause the curse, then it does not have any effect on me. If I have not spoken ill towards someone, if I have not um, released a curse, then it has no power over me. If I stay under the covering of the Father, if I am obedient because of love, then the curse has no hold over me. So when is there a curse? over me? When is there a cause for a curse over me? Only when I invite it into my life. In other words, when I speak it or do something that contradicts the Father's instructions and His will and purpose, that causes it. And this is what we see here with Balak and Balaam. The Israelites did not cause this curse that Balak wanted to speak over them to be over them. So Father did not allow it. Numbers 23, 8 says, How do I curse whom El has not cursed? How do I rage at whom Yah has not raged? Number 23, uh, Numbers 23, verse 22, El who brought them out of Mitzram is for them like the horns of a wild ox. He'll protect them. You see, it's about obedience. When we do and stay in the perfect will and purpose of the Father, then no weapon formed against me shall prosper. How many times have we 
you heard um, sermons about uh, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. But listen, child of the Most High, when you are in obedience, when you under His covering, then no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Listen to me today. Satan comes and tempts us. I want you to see this picture today. Satan comes and tempts us. So we have a decision to make. Are we going to take the bait of Satan? Are we going to fall into the trap of Satan? Are we going to be obedient to the temptation that Satan lures us with or not? We get to choose curse or blessing in our lives. Abba does not tempt us. You see, but every situation that the enemy brings our way, it's also a test. It's a test of obedience. Are we going to say yes or no? Are we going to fall into the trap or not? Are we going to follow darkness or light? That is the test. Father does not tempt us. He does not lure us into sin or disobedience. No, Satan does. That's what Balak wanted you. That's what Balaam suggested to Balak. Lure the children of, of Israel into temptation. The choice is this. That's the test. Are we going to choose life or death? You see, because now Father gets to see, are we going to stay obedient to Him or not? Papa says, I put before you today life or death. And then He goes on and He says, choose life. That's the test you and I have every day in our lives. That's the test that's before Israel now. Are they going to fall for the, uh, this adultery and idolatry uh, that the Moabites bring into the camps or not? We see in Torah over and over again that in obedience there is blessing. You see, with the Israelites being in their tents, it's a picture of their obedience. So William could not curse them he had to bless them. We read in Numbers 24 verse 5, How good are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. You see, the tents of Israel is an extension of the sanctuary. It's an extension of the tabernacle. It's an extension of the covering of the Father. Just like our bodies, this earthly temple is an extension of the Father's heavenly throne. And that is what William saw he saw the presence of the Most High and he had to bless. He could not curse them. As long as you and I abide in him and he in us, then we won't be cursed. But when we step out of our tents, when we walk out from under his covering, when we leave the, uh, the, the, the borders of his grace, my brothers and sisters, then we bring a curse unto ourselves. Because then we choose to be disobedient. Romans 6 verse 1 says, What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin to let favor increase? No, let it not be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? And this is what we see here in this parasha. The Israelites knew the truth of blessing and curses. They knew to stay in their tents and still, here, yeah, still some to choose to war with the enemy, to follow adultery and idolatry. Our faith lives are based on a covenant in where the Father wants to bless us and cover us. So who is Billiam? Is he a prophet of Abba Yah? Or, or, or is he just a prophet for hire who speaks blessing and curses as you pay him to do? You see, he clearly had an effect. He, he gets hired uh, a lot. In fact, here's a king who knows Billiam. 
Here's the king Balak who knows what Balaam can do because he says, whoever you bless is blessed, whoever you curse is cursed. And he wants this cursing. You see, because if he can curse Israel, then he'll be blessed in war. Isn't that what we do? We, 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 we curse people because we want to be blessed. So how do we recognize prophets? Or maybe let's not pick on prophets. Let's ask the question in today's uh, uh, communities, in our uh, Christian communities, in our churches, in our fellowships. Let's ask the question, can we recognize the spirit of Billiam in our church? In our fellowships, can we recognize the spirit of Billiam in the fivefold ministry? We see billion being offered cash for services. Makes you think about the current state in the body of Messiah where a lot of church leaders, pastors, the fivefold ministry so openly takes payment and offers for services. In fact, just like billion, they are selling their service and their knowledge. Now I'm not saying they should not get a salary or they should not get paid. But what is happening in our churches and our fellowships? Where the fivefold ministry are selling the wisdom and the knowledge and the revelation of Abba Yah. You see the revelations and the knowledge that the Father gave us, we then go and sell that information. If information and revelation and truth of the word that was given to us freely by His Ruach, by His Spirit, to equip you and me, to equip His children, now we go and sell that information. So many people in churches are building empires and wealth and their own kingdoms with this information that the Father gave freely. Information that His Son died on the cross for, so that you and I can be saved. Now we sell that information, we sell that knowledge, we sell that truth, we sell His light. Can we see this? We sell His light. Light that was supposed to be given for free to build up the body of Messiah. Now we want to sell that. What are we getting to? What's happening to our fivefold ministries, my brothers and sisters? Matthew 10 verse 8 we read, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Listen, you have received, you have received without payment. Give without being paid. What's happening to this? How about churches that expect you to pay for services? Expect you to pay for the knowledge they received from the Father. I'm not talking about paying for the materials and books in, in, in a Bible school. That's not, or in a church or some schools or whatever. Because that, that costs money to be printed. I'm talking about letting you pay huge sums of money for a course or a diploma or a certificate or even more. Churches and fellowships ask you to pay them to share revelation and knowledge that Abba gave them freely. You must now pay for that. What happened when we read Mark 8 verse 1 to 8? Messiah Yeshua taught 4,000 people and after he taught them, he fed them. Let's stay in Mark. Yeshua teaches 5,000 people in Mark 6 verse 30 to 44, and then he ends up feeding them as well. Can we see what Yeshua the Messiah did here? He fed their spirits for free with the truth of Abba Yah, and then he fed their flesh for free. What are we doing today? Not once that Messiah asked that 4,000 people, that 5,000 people, not once that he asked them to pay for this bread. Not once that he asked them to pay for the truth and the light of Yah he's sharing with them. When we walk in purpose, 
child of the Most High, then Father will bless us. He will bless us with what we need, but you and I need to walk in purpose. We need to be obedient. So here, Billiam goes on this new job opportunity to curse this people of Israel so that he can be richly compensated and, he, and receive honor and blessings and glory from this king and his people, the Moabite people. You see, Billiam decided on the blessing of man is more important than the blessings from the Father. Can we see this? Do we see this picture in our churches, in our fellowships, in our uh, Torah communities? Where, where our leaders build their own empires and their own kingdoms with the riches of this world. We also see that Billiam is a prophetic prototype of the false prophets and teachers who will appear in the end of days. We are told about the coming of the false messiah and the false prophet who will be doing wonders and promoting um, their own kingdom. Can we see pictures of this in our current churches and fellowships? We read in 1 John 2 verse 9 to 11, The one who says he is the light and hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother stays in the light and there is no stumbling block in him. But the one who hates his brother is the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. If we dwell in the darkness, then we come, we, uh, my brothers and sisters, we become darkness. If we dwell in evil, we become evil. You see, because my mind and my thoughts will be clouded by this evil. We will not be able to properly discern what is going on around me because of the darkness in my mind, the darkness in my heart, because I would rather want to curse than to bless. You see, fear, hatred, and so many other things of the darkness blinds us from truth. And this may be is the reason why Balak never sent messengers out to Moses. He assumed danger. He assumed a war was coming up. Balak trusted the fear in him. Is that what we do in our lives? We, with our fleshly eyes, we discern fear and then we start to act in that fear. Instead of asking the Spirit of the Father, for true revelation. So that I can discern in truth what's going on. When we are biased to someone or something. Then we do not think clearly. We read in Proverbs 4 verse 19. The way of the wrong is like darkness. They do not know at what they stumble. Can we see this? Because we walk in darkness. We see in darkness. Therefore, we do not see the stumbling blocks. When we walk in fear, we act in fear, and we do not see the stumbling blocks of fear. James 1 verse 19 to 20. So then, my beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of, of Elohim. You see, when we act in our danger, when we act in fear or when we act out of hatred, then we are not concerned for the well-being of the next person. Because we want our own well-being. We want ourselves to prosper. When we act out of these emotions, then we do not have mercy or grace towards the next person. Again, if we do not learn to manage anger or fear, then we do not discern. We should not let our emotions guide us. We should not let our emotions rule over us. You see, like we've seen last week, anger is an emotion. Albeit, yes, a secondary emotion that, that was brought on by frustration and disappointment. 
But we should not be guided by it. We should rule over our emotions. Like we should rule over sin. Like we should rule over fear. Like we should rule over darkness. You see, anger, fear or hatred will cause you and me to turn against our brethren. We're supposed to bless them and not curse them. We read in Numbers 22, verse 13 to 19. And Balaam rose in the morning and said to the heads of Bala, Go back to your land, for Yah has refused to allow me to go with you. And the heads of Moab arose and went to Balak and said to Balaam, Refuse to come with us. Then Balak again sent heads more numerous and more esteemed than they. Than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, This is what Balak, son of Tsepor, said. Do not withheld from coming to me, please, for I esteem you very greatly. And whatever you say to me, I do. Therefore, please come, curse the people for me. And Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Thou Balak went to, were to give me his house filled with silver and gold, I am unable to go beyond this point, beyond the word of Yah, my Allah, to do less or more. And now, please, you also stay here tonight. Let me find out what more Yah has to say. Can we see, firstly, what he says here? He says, even though Balak would offer me his house and the riches, all his riches, I can't go. So can we see the heart of Balaam there where he says, you, you, you should bring more. What you offer me is not big enough, it's not good enough, it's not riches enough, I want more. He says, I want more and then I'll go and see. So William says that, Yahuwah has spoken, he says, I can't go with you. So instead of saying that, I can't curse the children of Abba, he says, because Abba says, I can't go, I can't go. Instead of saying to them, listen, they are blessed by the Most High Creator Himself, therefore I can't curse them. He says, no, I can't go because Abba says I can't go. So we see that the message given to Balak on why Balaam didn't come was because he was told by Yah. He was told by Abba not to go, therefore he can't go. Instead of telling them, listen, they are blessed. I can't curse them. So therefore, Balak offers him more riches. So Balaam is saying here, you will hear from the Father. You will hear from the God of Israel. But not once did Balaam align himself with, with Israel. Can we see this? Children of the Most High. Do we align ourselves with Israel today? Do we align ourselves with the community of the High uh, most high king do we align ourselves with the fellowship of Abba Yahuwah what is Balaam trying to do here is he trying to convince Abba Yah to curse Israel or is he playing a game with these messengers is he playing a game with Balak saying give me more riches give me more esteem give me more honor so did Balaam want to commune with Abba Yah? Or did Balaam try to align himself with King Balak? You see, Father knows our hearts. Uh, Balaam in this verses is called a prophet. Are we like Balaam? So desperate to be liked by other people that we will curse people. We will follow the disobedient crowd. Is that what we do in our fellowships, in our communities and churches? Are we so desperate for riches that we will want to curse others just like Balaam? So does Balaam really have a relationship with Abba? Do you and I then really have a covenant relationship with Yeshua, our Messiah, if we curse instead of bless 
our communities, our churches, our people. How many times do we see and hear from Christians, so-called, that they say they believe in the Father and the Son, but they do not stand with Israel. They do not stand with the communities and the believers of the Father. Or, or even there's people that's, that claim they've got, they in a covenant relationship with him. They say they love him, but they dispute his feasts. They dispute his instructions. Or they say Abba's instructions is no longer valid. Because of grace, we no longer have to be obedient to that. You see, what's happening in our churches, my brothers and sisters, are we like Billiam? We claim to be speaking the truth. We claim to be walking the truth. We claim to be following the truth. We claim to be in the light, but we act and walk in darkness. You see, to be in covenant with Abba Yah is to be for His people is to stand on His word and every instruction. To be in covenant is to be a blessing unto others, so therefore we are called to bless each other. To be in covenant is to walk in light and not to act in darkness. We read in Numbers 22, verse 22, 22, And Elohim came to Biliam at night and said to him, If the men come to, you, come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you that you do. And Biliam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the heads of Moab. So did Abba change his mind here? Do we serve a confused God? Do we serve the confused Elohim, my brothers and sisters? Did Abba say, no, don't go, then okay, yes, go, and then decide that he should have stayed with his first decision? What's happening here? You see, Father knows our hearts. So could this have been a warning to Billiam? Could Father have wanted to make a point to Billiam to let him know that he can't curse Israel? Could Father have wanted to make a point to Billiam for Billiam to see that he is the most high creator? So Father says to him, go, but only what I tell you to say, you say. So then why go, Billiam? If you can't curse the people, why go? You see, Billiam is this prophet for hire. He was, uh, he, or he is to be hired to go and curse the children of Israel. Father says, bless them. Billiam still goes. So why did Billiam still go? Is the love for money and pride and prestige so strong with Billiam? Is the love for money and pride and prestige and, and acceptance so strong with you and me in our communities, my brothers and sisters? You see, so many times Father will allow us to follow the intentions of our hearts. But then we must know there's a price to be paid for it. If we seek the riches of the world, there's a curse that will come upon us. So many times we are set on doing our will. We are set on doing what we want. Go where we want to go. Do what we want to do. But we do not see the negative or hear the voice of the Father because we are so convinced within ourselves that what we are doing is what Abba wants us to do. This is what's happening with Billiam. He's so convinced within himself that what he's about to go and do, he climbs on his donkey, he's about to go to Moab, uh, to, 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 to the king of Moab. He's convinced what he's doing is right. You see, sometimes Father will leave us to our own devices so that we can get it out of our systems and hopefully we will see the light and return to Him. And yes, should we close or should we choose to continue on this path, then Father will leave us to our own distraction. Because finally, that's where uh, Billiam ended up. It's like saying you want to hear from the Father, but you listen to what the people tell you about Abba. 
instead of seeking Him yourself. Yes, I fully understand that Abba Yah raises up His fivefold ministry. He raises up uh, the teachers, the prophets, the, the pastors, the elders, the, the, the apostles to encourage us, to teach us, to pray for us. But still, you and I need to seek Him ourselves. We need to open up Scripture ourselves. We need to read ourselves as well. We need to pray ourselves as well. We need to study ourselves as well. So that we can be found in the light of the Father. You see, because if we do not study ourselves, we will and can be misled by and like Billiam. We might fall prey to false prophets and false teachings. You see, we need to discern what others are saying. But yes, we need to stay in the word of the Father as well. We can't just follow blindly what others call us to do. Child of Yah, what do we really want to hear? Do we want to hear our own hearts or the Father's voice? Do we want what we want or do we want what the Father wants for us? When we ask people what we should do, they might just advise you and me what we want to hear. Therefore, we should pray and ask. They might just tell you and me what we should do because it sounds like the right thing to do or it's something that they want us to do. That is when we should humble ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we should listen to the Spirit of the Father. We should humbly come to Him and ask Him to guide us, to show us. We need to discern the voices of the people and we need to discern what is from the Ruach, what is from the Spirit of the Father. Have we ever stopped to consider what is lukewarm? When Abba Yah says he will spit out those that is lukewarm, have we ever considered to ask ourselves, what does lukewarm look like? How does lukewarm act like? How does lukewarm speak? Could it be that those Christians, those who call themselves followers of the way, those who say they are Torah observant, those who say they have a relationship with the Most High, yeah, but do not do His will, those who want to benefit from ministry, to build their own riches and empires and kingdoms, could it be that that is what Abba Yah calls lukewarm? Could it be that those in our churches that speak curses instead of blessings, could it be that that is the image of lukewarmness? Could it be that those people in our fellowships and communities and churches that bring stumbling blocks in front of you and me, could it be that that is what lukewarmness looks like? My question to, do, to today is, Billiam, is he acting as a true prophet? Or is he lukewarm? Is he seeking riches? Is he seeking self-gain? Is he seeking his own desires? Is he seeking honor and glory so that he can build his own kingdom? Is that what lukewarmness looked like? We read in Titus 1 verse 16, They profess to know Elohim, but it works. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unfit for any good work. So they say they know Yah, but their works show something different. Just like Billiam. So his actions show something different. By his teaching, he says something different. You see, because he said to Balak, I can tell you what you can do. So that Israel can bring a curse on themselves. So his teaching is different to the blessings Father gave over Israel. You see, by our works, we reject or we follow. Because we'll see later on when he could not curse the children of Israel, like I've just said, he tells Balak what he can do to curse or to bring a curse onto Israel. 
So you see, child of the Most High, we say we follow, but we reject Him. We say we are obedient, but we do not follow his, all His instructions. It's like, it's, it's like saying, listen, I do the feasts of the Most High, but you only do six of the seven. You, you, you only do five of the seven. You don't do all seven feasts. My brothers and sisters, is that then not lukewarmness? Isaiah 29, 13. And Yah says, Because this people has drawn near with its mouth and with its lips, they have esteemed me. And it has kept and it has kept its heart far from me, and their fear of me has become a command of men that is taught. Can we see this? Their fear has become a command of men. So instead of our fear for Abba being His command, we are being guided by men. Can we see the spirit of Balaam, the spirit of lukewarmness here? He says he will, that instead of follow Abba and His instructions, we follow the commandments and instructions of men. We follow the hearts of men instead of following, following His heart. Malachi 2 verse 2 we read, If you do not hear and if you do not take it to heart to give esteem to my name, says Yah of hosts, it, I shall send a curse upon you and I shall curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them because you do not take it to heart. So we see that Abba Yah, he is the one who blesses and curses. He calls us to follow his heart and not the heart of men. If we turn from Him, if we turn from His blessings, then our blessings will be turned to curses. If we do not follow His footsteps, if we do not go where He sends us, then whatever we do, our footsteps will then lead us and we'll be walking into curses. We read in Psalm 97 verse 10 to 12, You who love Yah hate evil. He guards the lives of His lovingly committed ones. He delivers them out of the hand of the wrong. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in Yahuwah, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of His set apartness. Proverbs 11, 25-28 The generous being is enriched, and he who waters is also watered himself. Can we see? Those who blessed are blessed. The people curse him who withholds grain. But blessing is on the head of him who sells it. He who earnestly seeks good. The sells, in other words, gives it. Seek what is pleasing. But to him who seeks evil, it comes to him. He who truths is in riches falls. But the righteous flourish like a leaf. If you curse, you will be cursed. If you bless, then you will be blessed, Son of the Most High. If you give, you will receive. In other words, we should live our lives in a way that shows the goodness of the Father around us. Let's live our lives showing the Father in us to others. Let Abba Yah's heart be shown and living through you and me. Let's, let's keep uh, our tabernacles, our tents in obedience to Him. Our bodies should be centered around Him. You see, disobedience is a choice, brothers and sisters. Are we going to allow our eyes to be taken off the Father? Are we going to allow ourselves to be taken to a place of disobedience? Let's by faith remain in the protection of the Father. Let's by faith remain in the provisions of the Father. And let's by faith remain in the presence of the Father. By faith we can have a covering with Abba Yah. And by faith we know that Messiah Yeshua is our Savior. He is our covering. My brothers and sisters, we are destined to be blessed under the safety of His wings and protection. Can we see this? I want to end with Jude 1 verse 11. Woe to them because they have gone in the way 
of Cain and gave themselves to the delusion of Bilium for a reward and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So we know what happened to Cain. How he murdered his brother. We saw now what happened to Berlin because of the delusion of fame and riches. And then we studied Korach that came in rebellion to the, to the father. Can we see that all three men was disobedient to the Most High and the lives they end up living and how they died? So let's today, my brother and sister, let's walk in the truth of the Most High. Let's, let's walk in blessing because we are blessed by Him, because we dwell in our tents, because we dwell in His sanctuary, because we dwell under His covering. And let's not leave His covering for riches and fame. Let the word that leaves our mouths be a blessing and not curse. Let's pray. Abba Yah, Most High, Creator and Father, Daddy, thank you for this week. Thank you for the blessings in our lives, Abba. And Father, there's so many times we do not see the blessings in our lives because we, we take so many things for granted, Father. The houses we live in, the vehicles that we drive, the beds we sleep in, the what, what waters we have every night when we bath and shower, Father, so many things we just take for granted, Abba. Therefore, it's my prayer, Father, that your bride, it's my prayer, Father, that your children will start to discern the blessings in our lives, Father, that we'll see the blessings in our lives, Abba, and that we will stop looking at curses, that we'll stop looking at what we do not have, but rather see what we do have, Father. May we walk with a thankful heart every day, every minute and every hour of every day, with a thankful heart, Father. We praise you and we honor you, Abba, Yah, Thank you for this teaching, Father. Thank you for this message. Thank you for a new understanding in lukewarmness, Abba. Father, may we stay under your covering and not seek the covering of man. May we stay under your blessings and not seeking the blessings of men, Father. May we stay in your kingdom and not seek to build our own kingdoms, Abba. Thank you for the Shabbat. Thank you for your rest. We thank you for Yeshua, our Messiah, our Prince of Peace. And we ask, Messiah, that you will fill us with your peace in the Shabbat. We praise you and we honor you. We thank you for your presence, your protection, and your provisions in our lives. And it's my prayer, Father, that your kingdom will come. Let your kingdom come in our finances, in our relationship with our spouses, in our relationship with our children, in our relationship with the communities we live in, we work in, we pray in, and we teach in, Father. Let your will be done. In the name of your Son, Yahushua Messiah, our Master, our Shepherd, our Savior, our Redeemer, we pray all of this in your mighty name alone. Receive this blessing from the Most High. Yeverechicha, Yahua, Vishmerecha. Yaer, Yahua, Panabelecha. Vechunecha. Yesa, Yahua, Panabelecha. Vyasem, Necha, Shalom. Abba Yah bless you and keep you, my brothers and sisters. Abba Yah will make his face shine upon you and he'll be gracious to you. Abba Yah lifts up his countenance upon you and he gives you peace. Shalom, shalom.